Hi, my name's Sky Haldane. I'm a landscape architect and I work at the City of Melbourne in the team that are focused on really delivering the projects that um, are changing the city. This um, image was prepared as part of a public competition when, at the very early stage of the um, urban forest strategy. It was really trying to do, bring a bit of public awareness around some of the challenges that were facing the city for the future. And um, I'm not sure that that level of greening is necessarily where we'll be heading, but it's definitely showing a bit of a change from, um, from where we are, which um, is looking a little bit less um, ideal. So I've got my presentation's built around a number of the questions that um, were posed to us um, for this presentation. So it was really looking at Greater Melbourne is the fastest growing city in the developed world. Um, and that's not just the central city, but the whole of the Melbourne um, metropolitan area. And urban heating, climate change, rapid population growth and densification are proposing challenges to the livability and the future wellbeing of Melbournians. In um, 2009, we had our hottest day um, on record. Um, and the millennium drought was happening at the same time. Um, and had a significant impact on the city's green landscape. Um, the city was suffering under the longest recorded drought since settlement and severe water restrictions impacted heavily um, on the elderly tree population in particular and the state, garden state effectively was turning brown. Um, in response to this, there was strong community, um, I guess, feeling against the potential loss of those things that we really valued about our city. This is from a few years ago, so there'll be a lot more um, hours that would appear on that, um, that image now. But whilst parks and gardens are a key part of the identity of central Melbourne, the city's population is growing at a pace that is putting increasing pressure on these areas and seeing densification in areas where open space provision is scarce. So I, think, I guess whilst we do have some of those larger parklands, um, a lot of our city, central city really just doesn't have the proximity to those that would um, serve those local populations. So in understanding how the city is planning for these changes, it's valuable to look at how our current green spaces have evolved and what the past visions for the city have been that provide us with both the challenges and opportunities for future change. The whole grid was laid out um, with generous streets but without significant provision um, for open space. So within the grid itself, um, we really only have the State Library forecourt um, and, the, and the former city markets which provided those public spaces um, for people. The majority of the city's current parklands are those that were set aside on the edges of the city um, by Governor Latrobe in the 1840s and created the legacy of parklands that stretched from Albert Park to Royal Park and Flemington Racecourse and the garden squares um, in around Carlton and East Melbourne. With Melbourne's population continuing Outward, the focus didn't return to creating new open spaces in the city centre until the 1960s and 70s, when land for the city square was purchased by council and a new civic space was created for what was then still a city that em emptied of people in the evening as they returned to their homes in the suburbs. So that, that article was from 1980, which really talked about the, um, the city that we know now just wasn't as, as vibrant as, as this. And I, and I moved to the city in the early 90s just to go to university and... Um, I could easily walk home um, to Carlton from university without seeing maybe four or five other people. So the city's changed dramatically and that's largely to do with um, the initiatives of the council um, in the early 90s which were around um, encouraging people to come to the central city. Postcode 3000 was the strategy that was employed to do that and started to actively retrofit um, some of the underutilised buildings in the central city to, um, to create residential development. So the city's population has grown since then dramatically and I think now we have a population of Canberra effectively coming into the city every day um, to utilise the, the services and et cetera. Um, the city's population um, has grown but without signif significant new allocation of public spaces. Increasing demand and pressure on existing open spaces is changing the way people utilise these areas and there's increasing complexity to managing use and balancing the different functions of open space, providing for active recreation, relaxation and environmental functions. Development of facilities and infrastructure within these open, open space reserves and along the city's waterways are also posing challenges to the accessibility 
and quality of the city's green spaces. So one of the exemplars probably is the, the development of what was originally parkland um, in the Melbourne Park um, precinct. So whilst it's still public amenity, it's not actually delivering all of those um, benefits of green open space um, for which it, its original purpose um, was for. And with the development demands of the city's growth areas, and most of those in, um, in purple will be un undergoing um, significant growth in the coming years. Um, the value of inner city land represents a major challenge to the creation of new public space, with both private and government um, developments really having a focus on the economic return and, and a short-term um, view, rather than having a great vision, as La Trobe did, to set aside large areas um, for public use. This development also has seen the loss of permeability and further development within low-lying areas of the city and the wetlands and estuary of the river that um, Andrew referred to earlier. So we've got in increased issues around um, flooding of developed areas and previous industrial uses also um, give us the challenge of dealing with land contaminated land, which adds to the cost of providing those new public spaces as well. So what are we doing to combat this? Um, so in, in the mid-80s, um, there were some strategic plans that were really looking forward to how we could um, really shape that change to the central city. Um, they, those plans included the Melbourne um, Strategic Plan, Places for People and Grids and Greenery. And Grids and Greenery really, really identified opportunities for reconnecting the central um, business district with, with the rivers, which were separated by rail, railway lines. Um, Trying to connect up those um, green spaces with each other as well. Um, from those strategies, strategies came Batman Park and Enterprise Park, and then followed by Birungma, um, which was finished around um, 2000. And that was built over um, former railway land um, with the support of state government. Following that also um, saw the closure of Swanson Street to traffic in favour of pedestrians and cyclists. Um, and I guess places for people really recognised that the absence of open spaces within the city could be addressed through improving the quality of the streetscape experience. And having a shift towards pedestrians, cyclists and public transport over cars. And then in response to the drought and city population growth in 2008, City of Melbourne began to take significant steps in the development of a series of strategies, policies and programs to re respond to these environmental challenges. And some of those strategies are across the top there, which um, Warwick alluded to um, before. And a lot of that's really been about bringing the community on a journey to understand um, not only government's role and developers' role in these processes, but also the community valuing um, more the green assets that we do have. So with road reserves um, making up 80% of public land in the central city, we were really looking carefully at how we could create those new open space opportunities, um, but without the cost of needing to purchase um, freehold land in which to do that. So the adaptation of road has continued to be one of the major ways in which we can deliver on the open space um, strategy in particular, as well as the um, other environmental outcomes that come with in improving permeability. So this is... Errol Street in, in North Melbourne, which was completed several years ago. So that was on a small scale. We're continuing to look at how we can expand existing parklands. So University Square in Carlton is currently um, under construction with Barry Street on the western side, completely closed traffic, and Leicester Street on the east, um, just one-way traffic now. And then also um, at a slightly bigger scale again, converting road space in South Bank Boulevard um, the city's most densely populated suburb, which has an average about 2.5 square metres of public space per person. Um, New York has 20. Um, so you can just see that there's a bit of a schism there between how people who live in those high-rise apartments can actually access local neighbourhood space, which has been a key part of what we're trying to achieve here. This event in the top corner was when we um, were doing our public consultation. We closed, closed a section of the road and people were able to come down into the public realm, not just be on a little mean um, footpath. And people actually met people who lived in their buildings who they'd never actually spoken to um, before. So the role of public space is a multitude of actually connecting people and 
dealing with a lot of those issues around loneliness, which is the same health um, challenge really as smoking um, now for the city. So there's a range of benefits that we'll get from that project, which will deliver about two and a half hectares of public open space to that other. The other factor too is looking at how public spaces work harder and some of that is actually about how we collectively build relationships between different organisations in order to do that. So Andrew was talking before about the domain um, parklands of which the Botanic, the Botanic Garden sits within there. Concurrent with their master plan, we've just um, it had a 20-year master plan for the domain parklands endorsed and there's a number of different land owners who have different responsibilities for those areas. So combining our efforts and coordinating our work is really a key part of managing events and the different ranges of impacts of a more densely populated um, city on some of those really precious um, public spaces. Green space in the city is evolving in a number of ways and I've just got a few examples here of how different areas are starting to um, serve those purposes. So on the top left hand corner, um, this is a play street activity in Kensington, really looking at how um, streets will evolve um, really to serve the same purposes of, as public space. So traditional categories of parks, plazas and streetscapes really are starting to become a range of different hybrids depending on the needs of those local communities. Um, the top right hand corner is the commons in um, the Nightingale project and that's really about how residential developments are going to need to be providing their own backyard spaces for, um, for people because the public open spaces just won't, won't be doing that. So if people want to be gardening in cities, um, these are the kinds of ways in which that will need to happen. Um, the purpose of public, so the pressures on public space and limited areas um, means that privately owned spaces um, that are publicly accessible will, will play a larger role and this is the Sky Park um, in Docklands um, which is open to the, open to the public. And on the left hand side is one of the city's new vertical schools which is Halebury um, on, um, on King Street opposite Flagstaff Gardens. It has no outdoor space other than the rooftops um, and I noticed when looking for these images there's some great shots of the kids running in Flagstaff Gardens um, with the school behind it so that sense that um, those kids are going to be out in that park a lot and so the way in which that will put additional pressure on the way that that park needs to work, not only for those school children, but also for that growing um, community as well. At a really small scale, um, we're also looking at how our streets work differently um, and recognising in a more scientific lens how we understand and manage our public spaces. So this is one of our um, biodiversity corridors that we identified in the urban forest precinct plans. Um, it, it links the botanic gardens um, down towards the river. So getting a greater um, diversity of species in through there and funding research which helps the community to understand what it is that um, also lives in the city with us that we need to take care of. Um, my last slide is really about where I see things going in the future and I guess the densification of the city has really started to crowd out some of the um, ways in which we connect to Melbourne's broader landscape. Um, I went for a walk around the city recently and it's very rare that from the public realm you actually get views beyond city anymore. Um, so really understanding how you live within that broader um, environment um, is a bit of a challenge. So I think making sure that we start to recognise the land on which we live and the long history that, that is here um, before the couple of hundred that we have been, how can we actually belong better to this place and have that part of our... Um, our way of being here and to have some vision about setting aside some larger areas so we can actually have some wild places in our city so that we reduce the pressure and we give people an opportunity to get away from each other sometimes and um, that we don't need to necessarily leave our cities for those opportunities to be provided.